Welcome to The Culture Bar, a panel discussion podcast exploring, dissecting and shedding light on important topics in the arts and music world which matter to you. Hello, I'm Fiona Livingston. This is a special bonus episode of The Culture Bar and is a little bit different to our previous episodes and format. In season one, we asked a post-interview question to our guests, which was, how will technology influence arts and culture? We have now put together these informative and insightful snippets so that you can hear how the experts think digital and tech will impact the arts and culture and what this might look like. From episode one, the Green New Deal and the arts, Professor Anatole Levin of Georgetown University in Qatar gave his insights to Henry Southern where he highlighted not only the speed of change of tech and the possibilities of being left behind, but the excitement of the new possibilities it brings, especially to architecture, sustainability and public spaces. The problem is that technology is is changing so fast now. I I mean, you know, my my, my students can't believe that I, I... I lived most of my life, you know, before the era of mobile phones, I mean, let alone the internet and so forth. In our second episode, Sponsorship in a Pandemic, arts development and fundraising expert Diana Williams, Simon Fairclough from CBSO and Charlotte Appleyard from the Royal Academy of Arts talked about the need for a blended approach of live and digital and added value experiences. How technology can make arts events special the opportunities for creative monetization strategies and how the arts need to look to other sectors for inspiration in this area. I think we've seen during lockdown how much you can get out of just being engaged over the web with different art forms. And I think you and I spoke, Henry, earlier on about one of the first programs I watched in lockdown was Museums in Quarantine which I thought was amazing on Channel 4. And we had Simon Sharma and we had the curator of the tape going through Andy Warhol exhibition. I was just you and the curator going through and you felt like you were in those gallery rooms and you're getting one-on-one expertise explaining um, the work to you. And I think some of these um, sort of one-on-one experiences or group experiences on Zoom, where you get the expertise that maybe you wouldn't if you just went into a museum or a gallery, um, has been amazing. I think probably in performing arts, it's the same. I've watched the National Theatre. I've put up a big screen. I felt like I was there actually in the theatre. So, and I think that outreach to many diverse cultures and audiences around the world who can't get to London or to Birmingham or to Edinburgh, to major centres, is amazing. So, but I still have to say, it doesn't totally replace being there in situ. And I think we're all looking forward to going back to actually being in a concert hall, to being in the gallery spaces. Um, But I think a blended approach, I know everyone has used that word a lot, is is probably what the future is going to be like. And um, I think we just got to take the best that technology can offer, but blended with the physical experience as well. So that would be my view. Well, it's interesting what you're saying also about um, added value. So the experience which you had with the museums and culture and something we're looking at at House of Paris certainly is not just offering that digital content not only for free, but what the added value that you can bring. If you're going to ask people to pay for it, the experience has to be more than what you would get in a concert hall. So behind the scenes um, footage, musicological insights or whatever it might be, or even have Deliveroo deliver you a drink or whatever it might be. <laughs> um, Simon, you were nodding away a lot there. Are you, are you happy to take on next? Yeah, I agree with a lot of what Diane has said. I suppose from my perspective, the really interesting question is to what extent technology and the art form can blend to create something that's a new art form, if you like, a, 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 a kind of art which you couldn't create just with, you know, without the technology or without the art, I suppose. So I think that could manifest itself both in content that's distributed digitally, so online content or broadcast content, or actually in the physical spaces that we normally inhabit. And I think this is a particular issue for uh, performing organisations like mine, and one that we were thinking about before the, the lockdown began, perhaps uh, less so than, than galleries and museums, we have been perhaps a bit slow to embrace 
and include technology within the visitor experience of coming to a performance. And I think there's a huge opportunity to, to introduce technology into the concert experience in new ways in order to reveal the music in a clearer and easier to understand way to a new generation of audience members who are very used to processing information on screen and uh, and and uh, experiencing things digitally. So, so I think for me, the interesting question is how to create that blended approach which adds to the art, both online and in the physical experience. And I think the crucial point there is that uh, we are going to, I fear, end up with such a glut of very similar content from different organisations that the next key question will be, how do we distinguish ourselves from each other? What can we do that's a bit distinctive? And the reason, one of the reasons that we haven't rushed to put out a huge amount of digital content earlier than this is that we spent quite a bit of time during the lockdown thinking, what do we do in the digital content that we do create that makes it stand out from the crowd a little bit rather than just looking exactly like all the other orchestra's content and I think that's going to be really important. With that in mind, um, an example of that in terms of distinguishing from other orchestras, the Philharmonia for a long time in, in London, the Orchestra in London, they've um, had their um, AI, or sorry, uh, virtual reality installations and do you think virtual reality, augmented reality, mixed reality, you name it, do you think they'll have uh, inform your digital discussions going forward? They've been on the periphery of what we've discussed, but I have to say we are learning very quickly. And, you know, this has been a big pivot for us as an organisation. So we're learning as we go along. I'm sure we'll learn more about AI uh, and virtual reality and so on uh, in the future. Thank you. Charlotte, over to you, please. I don't think I have a way that it's definitely a, a sort of specific way that it's going to change, but I think what inevitably will happen and has to happen is that it will be monetized. I think that we, we spoke earlier about um, us all with all the right intentions because art belongs to everybody. We all put it out there because we wanted to engage people and we wanted to make people feel better during lockdown. But I think ultimately, as government gets less money, as it becomes harder to produce great art, costs go up, uh, we're gonna have to find a way to monetize the online experience. And I, I don't have the answer to that. I think we'll have to look to what newspapers did. Um, the, the area that I get laughed at sometimes when I talk about my inspiration is actually what football clubs do. Um, another great passion of mine other than the arts. And actually, I think that um, a lot of what the football clubs are doing for their fans, for their ticket holders, to, to, to speak earlier about the blended experience, not so much the art form itself, which um, I, I sort of don't feel qualified enough to speak on, but actually the way you can experience it in different ways for different sums of money, you know, um, I think they're doing some really interesting things that I know that it would seem perhaps anathema to suggest that they're the same thing, but I often compare our friends to, our se to season ticket holders. You know, that it's the same passion, it's the same annual commitment. And actually for that, they want a little bit extra. And I think what football clubs do uh, for their fans are really interesting and could be very easily transferable to the arts. So it's a sort of, I'm afraid it's a slightly uh, soft answer, but I, I think that ultimately it will have to and will force us to find ways to monetize the online experience. So do you anticipate um, a match of the day equivalent for the arts in the future? I think, um, I, look, I, I'm not going to pretend, I mean, football's the ultimate, um, you know, it's it's a bit more of an everyman than uh, perhaps going to see Picasso on paper. But I I think some of the stuff they're doing, some of the football clubs, uh, I mean, one in particular that I don't particularly like, Manchester United, is doing some brilliant stuff with, um, no, they're terrible, I support City. Um, but they're doing some really interesting stuff with second screen technology, so you watch the match in one place, but actually, if you're a certain level of season ticket holder, you get exclusive content on your phone or equally the sort of pre-match experience if you were a big sponsor where you would perhaps be taken down to the locker rooms or onto the pitch and meet you know the great and the good either the manager or indeed former players etc um, that's turning into online zoom calls with um, with those people which actually are way more effective than 10 minutes on the pitch etc and I think some of this we're doing but I think there's a lot more that can be done and I think um, I'm not saying it's the only example I just I, I like to use it as one because it's one I also understand. In our third Meet Eat podcast episode International Cultural Exchange 
we covered everything from COVID-19, climate change and Brexit. Our guests, Nadia Race from the British Museum, Roy Luxford from Edinburgh International Festival and Rafi Goke wall from Harrison Parrott gave us an international perspective on tech and the arts, including a new period of experimentation, balancing the fast pace of tech with the restful nature of the arts, the inspirational influence of creatives such as on composers and directors, and the rise of concerts and events made just for digital mediums and opportunities to dive deeper into the arts through VR, AR and immersive experiences. If I think of arts, I always think it's eternal, it's slow, it's relaxing. And then if I think of technology, it's ephemeral and fast and urgent. So I think we should really be experimenting because that's what art has always done and technology does too. And make sure that there is um, a two-way flow because both can be uniquely energizing and I think if carefully combined they can make an irresistible duet. I think um, technology has always had an influence on artists um, it, um, but maybe in quite practical ways the way a piece of work is crafted, um, how a particular um, uh, uh, scientific or um, piece of work has influenced, uh, I'm thinking of Wayne McGregor sequencing his DNA for um, a, a piece we premiered, um, thinking of Simon McBurney and his incredible use of sound and sound capture in his show The Encounter. So I think technology has always had that sort of uh, influence and indeed back to venues, our venues are so sophisticated now from a technological perspective. Um, but I wonder whether technology will unlock this idea of not having to travel to a particular place to experience a live performance. Um, I wonder if that is something in the um, uh, AR or VR world that might really be, but, but might be transformative to create a performance which isn't trying to replicate a concert hall or a theatre, but it'll be a piece of work that is um, at its as aesthetic heart um, made for that space, which audiences can enjoy for um, a version of the concert hall or the theatre. I mean, I, I, yes, and how quickly or how slowly that comes, who knows? It's not an easy, easy uh, question, actually, because uh, as I think, as Nadia said, uh, we don't know where it will go. Um, in some ways, uh, perhaps paradoxically, some artists will just say, I don't want to use technology at all. Uh, it will uh, go so far that maybe some people will want to see things that will not include technology. But I think the uh, opportunities are, are limitless. And uh, I think as Roy was saying with VR and AR, where it's going and um, what I'm very interested with VR and AR is that um, for people that cannot travel and perhaps with, uh, with the climate change and where climate change will go, if you cannot travel, perhaps you can, maybe technology will help in creating such an immersive experience that you may feel that you are in that space, that you are walking. I mean, I was, um, I was lucky enough to, to try some of the six degree walk in VR, for example. It was just an incredible feeling. And I really felt that I was, in, in, a, in a different world. And uh, my mind played the trick on me that I was there. And, uh, and I never thought that it would happen. So I think the opportunities are, are actually limitless. And I know Roy, the project with Simon McBurney, that sound uh, project with the encounter was, it, it was incredible. Uh, I mean, it, it, similarly, it just, my mind played a trick on me and I was, there was nothing on stage Yet I felt I was in the Amazon forest, <laughs> and uh, and uh, and that's what uh, technology um, can do. Um, is, is that an example of maybe the arts influencing technology? Yes, the arts influence in technology. I think that's a very good way of putting it because um, because we always think about how technology will influence art, but it might be the other way around. Um, I am also curious where artificial intelligence will go and uh and for example things like new applications like uh, TikTok and how they use artificially intelligence music in their application 
um, now it's reaching hundreds of thousand people, music of artificial intelligence. And, uh, and I'm just curious where that will lead and how um, artists will be influenced by, by that and vice versa. Um, uh, but it's not only that, when we talk about technology, there is some um, things, uh, when you were talking, we were just inspired by the um, DNA. Um, but for example, uh, there, is a, uh, there is a string theory that is looking at the very, very minuscule things of what thing molecules are made out of. And in order to, there are new technological tools that are being built to research that. I just wonder whether with technology we can go even deeper into the art forms and into the objects uh, inspired by that. <laughs> in our fourth podcast, exactly about this question, tech, COVID and the future, our guests were all record label and online music streaming experts. So who better than to tell us what the future looks like? Til Yankchukovic from Idagio, Ben Hogwood from Naxos, and Silvia Pietrosanti from Pentatone gave insights into how tech gives greater access to new audiences and breaks down barriers, allows multiple opportunities for new formats and entrepreneurship from artists, a potential rise in individualism, seeing artists starting to take more charge of their careers and creative output, and artists involving and directly communicating with audiences. Let's see what they have to say. Well, maybe um, taking up on something that, uh, 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 that Sylvia said, and also taking up on something um, what uh, Ben uh, Klaus Heimann of Naxos once said, um, I think the big problem is, that the only business model in music is probably piano recital, end of quote. An orchestra isn't a business model. This is what Klaus Heimann said, and it's remarkable. It's unfortunately very, very true, number one. And number two, Sylvia, you said why. As people want to understand the why. And I believe that we are uh, ending up in a situation where gatekeepers are going to lose power. I think that the entrepreneurial drive, the need to survive, to the need to come up with new things will um, bring up results from very, very creative and highly gifted group of artists that we all have the privilege to work with will produce new formats. I also would believe that the entire um, business is probably shrinking. Um, I don't say it's good. I don't say it's bad. I just think this is going to happen. I think that um, when I think in 2010 or 2011, there was this volcano where we couldn't fly for three or four, or four months. Uh, Norman Lebrecht wrote, London can easily survive for 10 years without listening to an Australian symphony orchestra. Um, I think the translation of this is end of quote, but I think the overall touring business will shrink and I think that we will witness a very, very strong um, raise of local artists and localization. Mm -hmm. And I think this is a very good thing because you could also say that globalization, for example, a conductor having three orchestras in three uh, parts of the world kind of... Uh, mainstreamed or streamlined uh, uh, the color of an orchestra, the way of phrasing. And we very often see this phenomenon where you have the Munich Philharmonic with the Schillerbidake or, or Simon with, 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 with Birmingham or I don't know, uh, Theodor Kurenzis with his orchestra in, 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 in Russia. The more artistic entities are a little bit cut off from the world, the more individualism they are producing. Podcast episode number five centered around choral singing and provided unique insights on how technology can help this musical medium. Our choral expert guests, Paul Evans, Canon of Ely Cathedral, Sophie Janin, Chief Conductor of BBC Singers, and Tido Visser, Artistic Director of the Netherlands Chamber Choir, highlighted the importance of being able to sing together and maintain human connections. But that tech has led to the democratization of the arts by reaching new audiences and how we need to increasingly think about music also as a visual medium. Let's see what they said. I'm really struggling with this at the moment, so um, I, I can't talk about how it might affect the arts. Um, I'm minded, back to the psalm, Psalm 131, Lord, I'm not high-minded. I do not consider high things because they are too great for me. I can't do the arts, 
but I'm really struggling with the quality of broadcast services. Um, I think this COVID wretchedness is going to be with us for some time. This isn't going to be over next year. This is we're probably looking at 2021 with a shift into broadcasting of content, religious content. Um, and at the moment, it's really crap. Um, it is literally some old bloke with an iPhone shaking in his hand and getting some sense of how an amateur, essentially an amateur uh, organization can promote excellence in broadcast media um, so that people want to watch. And um, we've got some, we've found some absolute stars, but we're really struggling with the technology. I have to say. First of all, uh, we do have technology to thank for being able to do something during this COVID crisis. Uh, however, uh, I must say that, you know, putting together these sort of distant um, choral pieces together, everyone singing at home, and um, it's, it's a very uh, tiresome process and it's not what it is to sing together. So it is a double-edged sword. Uh, what I've felt is um, that we have become so acutely aware of the visual aspects of uh, choral music. Uh, and this has for me been a, a little bit of a struggle. Um, I've never really reflected into those senses. And I think that we become very image aware at the moment, very concept aware. Um, so it's, it's certainly something that I have to get on board with. Um, I think that technology and is, is marvelous for its democratization of arts. And this is what I think is, is its most precious uh, quality for me to be able to have been growing up in a, in a rural village, but hearing things being uh, played at the Met or, you know, sung in, in, in Cambridge uh, for Christmas Eve. Um, both of those things are, are quite precious. So for me, technology can help the arts by simply bringing it out to the maximum of people. Yeah, in this current COVID crisis, um, we were asked by the Ministry of Culture who, who, uh, um, who supports us, um, if we could think of new business models, and of course then thinking also of that technological um solutions for the fact that we're in this crisis at the same time i i i, I pointed out to them so listen we are eventually we thrive on the fact that um on 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 the contact with our audience on the being on that stage and creating together with your audience that 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 almost sacred space so uh, I'm glad to think about any form of model and of any form of technology, but at the same time, we do have to bear in mind that we are on this earth to uh, be amongst people. And when you sing with a choir, like in Knut Niestet's uh, the Immortal Bach, and you surround the audience um, uh, with the choir and you sing those, those notes, those beautiful chords, clusters of notes, uh and people uh, burst into tears then you know why you're doing it you can never ever reshape that in uh, with uh, with uh, with whatever uh, surround system you have but you have those people around you those top singers creating those beautiful chords and that's what what really makes yeah awakes the emotions so Yes, I'm, I'm, I mean, we're doing a production now with, uh, uh, with the Tears of St. Peter. Uh, it's an, become an, also visually an amazing production, but also with a lot of technology. We have seven singers singing in seven glass tubes. They're all wired with microphones, they have in-ears. They're still able to sing magnificently together. The lasso uh, sounds beautifully. The, the, those are the, the, the good things of the COVID crisis. You can also come up with 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 other formats and concepts. So there there are beautiful things deriving from the th thinking about technology. At the same time, um, it's that live experience uh, that we um, so desperately need. Our final tech-focused insights are from episode ten: oil and water. Can art and digital mix? Here we asked practicing mixed media artist Laura Hendricks and assistant art gallery curator Wells Frey Smith 
on how technology can help to communicate artworks to audiences. It's interesting because I mentioned that I didn't consider myself in the art world or, or an artist for most of my life. And so I, I think that I always remember this experience when uh, my husband and I were visiting New York and uh, we just popped into a random gallery one time and just were exploring and we walked in and there was this exhibit that was this virtual reality exhibit. And um, so we put on these virtual reality, you know, whatever they're called, <laughs> headset. And um, I just was taken to this different world that was just mind blowing to me. I was so inspired. I felt like I was on a high, just like going through this virtual reality experience. And um, it's interesting because we walked through this artist exhibit before we did the virtual reality experience at the end. And she had paintings and sculptures and all these things. And I just gave them no notice. Like, to be honest, I just didn't, they didn't like capture me at all. And I just was like, oh, whatever. And I walked to the back of the, the gallery. And when I experienced that, it was like, after I experienced that, then I like took my time with like each thing that she had and each piece. And I like read the write-ups. And so for me, I always go back to, to, at least for me and my interests, that is what like made me a super fan of her work now. And I've like followed her on Instagram and I'm like, keep track of what she does. And I'm just like in love with her and all of her work and recently bought my first piece from her and was so excited. And I just think like, at least for whatever reason, her art was not, it didn't grab me, but that virtual reality experience just like transformed the way I felt about it. And obviously that's not to say, I think that that's like every artist needs this virtual reality experience by any means, but I think that yes, like it can be a tool that's used for such like so powerful, you know, to capture a, a certain type of audience or to bring your art to life if it lends itself to that. Laura, I love that story so much because I think as um, as a curator, I think I always have a fear essentially about the efficacy of technology sitting alongside a physical experience. And I'm always primarily actually thinking about a physical experience rather than a technological one, but it's great to hear how they can go together. Um, my sense with technology is that it can be used really powerfully, but it also can be used really terribly sometimes, if, if I'm honest. And I like examples when it's used best, when it either enhances a physical experience and helps you look again at the work, as was Laura's case, or approach it from a different angle. I think one of the things that's so powerful for me about a live in-person experience of art is that it can elicit responses on so many different levels, be it like emotional, physical, intellectual, visceral. So when technology can help with that and can help in storytelling, um, I think it's wonderful. But I do also carry fears about it eclipsing the actual work in some instances. Um, and, you know, this throws up big existential things for me about museums and, and what they're for, because I think we, a lot of people are still stuck, I think on quite a traditional model of a museum really as being like a center for education or a kind of civic space. And what technology throws up is that actually they can be great leisure spaces and they can be sp spaces of intense entertainment. But I, I think a question is how museums can keep up because the rate of technological advancement is so huge and museums do not honestly have the budgets to keep up with that. And so my feeling is that any investment that museums and institutions make in harnessing devices, be it you know screens or AR or VR or QR codes, needs to enhance the experience for the audience in a way that serves the mission of the museum 
and also integrates kind of the lowest common denominator of visitors. So it can be as far reaching and accessible as possible. Thank you to Merlin Thomas, our editor, and Robert Cochran, composer of our theme tune music. We really hoped you enjoyed this bonus podcast. And if you haven't done so already, be sure to check out all other episodes from the Culture Bar with topics ranging from can art and digital mix to awareness and representation in the arts. We've had guests from the Whitechapel Gallery, BBC, British Museum and a former football pro referee to members of the UK Parliament and practising musicians and artists. And to get all of that and more, please subscribe or leave us a review. Thank you.